Um, we are so happy to see so many of you and I see it's from all over, even from the USA. So welcome to everybody. Uh, my name is Anna Forendran. I'm the Executive Manager of ICANN. And I'm just going to do some introduction and housekeeping rules uh, before we start off. Uh, there will be translation in Portuguese and Arabic while we are um, conducting the webinar. So I'm asking that presenters to just please uh, take that into consideration and, and look at the speed of how we talk, and then also to try and keep to the time to help the interpreters with the conducting of the interpretation. Um, I also want to ask all the participants to please keep your videos off and also keep yourself muted. There are a Q, uh, Q question and answer box, a Q&A. If you can please post your questions in there. Uh, we won't be able to answer any questions at the moment or any raised hands. At the end of the session, there will be time where we will go through to the questions that hasn't been answered and try and see if we can get any of the panelists to assist you with your uh, burning question. Um, from there, I want to just also say that there will be some um, live streaming, if I'm not cor um, correct. Um, Susan, please help me. We normally do a live streaming or recording and post it later. It also will be available on the websites, and all the participants that register will get um, pr the presentations that are being presented as well. So from my side, I just want to say thank you very much. Also, the French version will happen on a Thursday every week. So um, they are running one week um, short or behind us, so they will be running a week later. But they will have the same sessions as what we have. Yeah. Um, and then we are looking into starting a next series uh, with maybe a one-week break. We will have um, a session on the monitoring and evaluation tool from Resolve to Save Lives on the 23rd, but we will see some communication going out to all of you as well. So I'm going to hand over now to Dr. Patrick Kwabe from Africa CDC, that's of COVID in Africa. Welcome, Dr. Patrick. Thank you so much, Anne. Some noise in the background. Uh, okay. Thank you so much, Anne. I uh, hope you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you very well. Okay, let me just um, start the slides. All right, uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning, colleagues. Uh, so I'll quickly take you through the uh, epidemiological updates uh, for the COVID-19 on the continent and as well as um, uh, globally. So as seen on this slide, um, as of 9 a.m. Eastern African time today, over 173 million cases and over 3.7 million deaths have been reported globally, uh, giving a case fatality rate of 2.1%. Uh, Africa accounts for 3.3% of the total cases uh, that have actually been reported globally. And here to the right is an epidemiological curve showing new COVID-19 cases reported daily uh, globally by the WHO regions. Uh, it shows a downward trend uh, in, the, in the number of new cases attributed to the continual decline in new cases reported in India. However, there is an upward trajectory in new cases that is seen in the West uh, Pacific uh, uh, region. So uh, this slide is showing the trend of COVID-19 cases uh, from the beginning of the pandemic to date uh, in Africa. So the epic curve on the right is showing the number of new cases reported by day, and the red line is showing the seven-day moving average. So we are seeing the trend of new cases uh, being reported by day is actually still on an upward trend uh, overall uh, on the continent. And cumulatively, over 4.9 million cases have been reported with over 133,000 deaths resulting in a case fatality ratio of 2.7%. And uh, it's important to note that uh, um, this CFR is actually greater than a global case fatality rate, uh, which stands at 2.1%. Uh, uh, also important to note that uh, of the cases reported, 90% have actually uh, recovered. So this table is showing the distribution of COVID-19 cases, deaths, and recoveries by AU regions. So in the last 24 hours, over 9,000 new cases, uh, about 259 new deaths, and uh, over 
9,000 new recoveries have been reported from the 55 uh, member states in the region. Also important, to, also important to note that close to 70% of the new cases have been reported from the uh, southern region. I think someone mute. Yeah, uh, I can't get to this. Um, Susan, can you can you mute? Uh, okay, thank you. All right, so uh, this slide is showing the COVID-19 uh, case fatality rate by AU member states. So there are five categories here. So 23 countries have a case fatality rate that is between 1 to 2.1%. Uh, 17 countries have a case fatality ratio that is between 2.25%. So we're also seeing 10 countries having a CFR that is less than 1%. Uh, well, four countries have a CFR that is greater than 5%. And uh, these countries are with a high CFR on the continent are remain Egypt, uh, Somalia, uh, Sudan, and uh, Sirawi uh, Republic. So this, gra this graph is showing the cumulative testing in all member states. So uh, here we're seeing that a close to 15 million tests have been conducted across the continent. Uh, the overall positivity rate currently stands at 10.1%, and the overall test by case ratio currently stands at 9.9 uh, tests per uh, reported case, which is a bare um, a minimum of uh, you know, what's recommended for testing by the Africa CDC and what of the organization. So any test below 10 uh, shows that uh, many countries actually are not um, are testing enough and uh, many cases could actually be going uh, undetected. And uh, finally, uh, looking at the positivity, uh, that is um, in uh, the new tests in, in member states. So we are seeing uh, that uh, 17 countries have test positivity, which is less than uh, 2%. But I think uh, the concerning one is um, about um, uh, nine uh, countries that have a test uh, positive greater than uh, 10 uh, percent. And uh, important to note that uh, we do not have lab, lab information for 16 countries uh, uh, this week uh, under review. So I'll end here. Over to you, Anne. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Patrick. It was great to see this, and it's really nice to see every week how we can update everybody around the globe as well. And I again want to welcome everybody that let's start joining us again before if we can just try and erica i know you um, you're on both you can only be on one device otherwise we won't be able to hear you there will be a um backlog so if you can just join onto one um device you don't need to have your video on if you don't need to because it could affect your bandwidth as well there is some interpretation in Arabic and in Portuguese. And um, I just want to also mention to our speakers to try and just slow down a little bit when we speak. Otherwise, it's very difficult for them to keep up with the translation. Um, I'm going to hand over to our next speaker and uh, we will see if she will be able to, draw, to share a screen. First, I just want to like to introduce her. Her name is Erika and I'm not going to even try and um, pronounce her surname. Um, it's very difficult for me to pronounce it, but Erika is from Cameroon, and she's a nurse at um, the Itok Baptist Hospital in Uwande. So Erika is going to talk to us about new natal sepsis project that I've done there. Welcome, Erika, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you. You can unmute now, Erika. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm sorry, I had some technical hitches. Uh, I'm happy to do this presentation again. I'm called Me Epus Hijofme Erika Lisa. And Good. I'm pre I'm presenting about Bans of Baptist Hospital, though I'm presenting from Etukebe Baptist Hospital. And I'll be talking on neonatal sepsis. Erika, will you be able to share your screen? Uh, I sent my presentation to Anna. I don't know if she sent it. I have some technical problems. I can here. share it if you have a problem, and then you can just let me know. Yes, please. You can put up the presentation. OK, let me put up your presentation, and then it's easier for you to talk. You can just tell me when you want me to. Um, move on, but just hold on one second, you know, we'll share my screen with you all. Okay. 
going to go to. Okay. Can you all see my screen now? Yes, thank you. Okay. You can okay. go ahead. All right, thank you. I'll be presenting this morning on neonatal sepsis outbreak control and present and prevention. And uh, the case study is Bansal Baptist Hospital. Okay. Okay. I'm calling me Erica and I'm presenting on behalf of the maternity staff of Bansal Baptist Hospital. And uh okay. Go ahead. All right. Banso Baptist Hospital is a 315 bed capacity tertiary referral hospital, which is actually run by the Cameroon Baptist Convention Health Services. It was founded in 1949 and it is one of the oldest and biggest hospitals in the CDC Health Services. And it offers both inpatient and OPD um, services. It has an average year, yearly attendance of about 6,000 patients. It is located in the division of the Northwest region of Cameroon. Now, uh, coming to the problem, neonatal sepsis, what, what was actually the, what was the, what was the problem statement? Uh, before the prevention set in, there were frequent outbreaks of neonatal sepsis. Uh, the children born in the unit actually had skin postules and septic knee aspirin. About three times of those outbreaks before 2002. And that led to poor quality of care and there was ad additional hospital stay and cost of care consequently. These isolates were actually resistant to available antibiotics, and they were basically Staphylococcus aureus and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And what are the factors that led to this problem? At that time, there were limited hand hygiene points in the unit, in the maternity unit. We, uh, we, had, we actually had one sink in a 30-bed unit, and that thing was reserved for drinking. You actually saw a note written on the sink, reserved for drinking. And there was poor hand hygiene and generally IPC practices as there was limited knowledge. And the third factor was that uh, there were shared items between babies. There were some common use items like the soap in the morning, what would but what obtains was that the midwife will take a bowl and will bathe all the children in that bowl using the same soap and using the same body lotion. And we know with uh, hospitality, with Nightingale what one advantage is that uh, patients and caregivers are able to socialize. So they also shared other things, maybe napkins, diapers, and so on. The mothers shared uh, for their children. And there was inadequate disinfection of items between use. For example, 0.05% of chlorine was used instead of 0.5%, which is the standard. So there was uh, inadequate disinf disinfection. So the bowl that was used for children wasn't adequately disinfected. So you bathe one child and then take the other child, just put the water and continue bathing. So those are some of the factors that led to the problem, to the outbreak of neonatal sepsis in the unit. Four key strategies were taken. Those, uh, when those outbreaks were identified, there were four key strategies that were taken. The first thing was surveillance, uh, <coughs> training, supplies, and uh, leadership. For the first uh, strategy, surveillance, what, what, what happened? Case definitions were established, and then a case register was opened. They had daily case review and week case conferences. Education sessions were also done, and there was one-on-one -on -one discussions with one-on-one uh, -on -one discussions with staff of that particular unit. The next uh, was training. 
and there was an IPC training and retrainings were done, were organized for the staff of the maternity unit. The next thing was supplies. The knowledge without adequate supplies could have meant nothing. So supplies were made available. And what were the supplies? The first thing is that since to institute a sink could have been more expensive, uh, the, uh, we had locally fabricated portable hand washing points, which were produced by the IPC team at that moment, and they were placed as strategic um, areas. Basically, uh, what, what was done was that a bucket was, was put up and a tap, uh, a faucet was connected to the bucket. So it served like a tap where you could actually have running water to wash your hands. So they, they are cheaper and easier to fabricate. They were made and placed at strategic points in the hospital. Alcohol-based hand rub uh, production also commenced. It was done locally. Since there was no, we did not have a central production unit to produce that, so we started. Uh, uh, it started in Bansal Baptist Hospital locally using the WHO formulation of one one hundred mils to two mils of glycerin, and then all individual use items such as the bathing soap and uh, petroleum jelly, jelly was introduced. So from that moment, when you are coming to the maternity, you are told to bring your items for your baby. Uh, items were no longer shared. And then all mothers had to bring items for their babies to be used only on their babies. And mothers were also advised against sharing items with neighbors. And then next, uh, what were the results? After the first steps were done, what were the results? Cases of neonatal sepsis actually dropped from 86% live births in 2002 to 20 in 2003, and finally was eliminated in 2006. From 2006, we did not have any cases of neonatal sepsis again. Another thing is that alcohol-based hand rub is now produced locally and used all over the CBC health services. We have a unit which produces it and supplies to all the, the institutions or the health services. And then hand hygiene compliance has improved due to the availability of alcohol-based hand rub. We know the advantages of hand rub. Uh, one of the advantages of hand rub over hand washing is that it actually improves compliance because you don't need uh, the materials you need. They're not very cumbersome. You just need your alcohol-based hand rub in a portable container and you are able to move around with uh, during your care activities. And other all the other innovations, like the improvised bucket, and so on, have been scaled up. You will see those buckets replicated in other units and other institutions. So that's actually one of the, the results from that outbreak, and uh, the innovations have been scaled up to other units and other facilities. The Erika, we've lost you. Next thing was leadership. Now, with what was done to in what we have already started. So they, they, they were able to convince the top management of the institution, of the organization at that time to prioritize IPC in their activities. So the CEO, Professor T. Pius, announced his commitment to that after he was convinced by the uh, IPC team at that time that IPC was the way to go and hand hygiene particularly was very important. So he actually announced his commitment and that was, I quote, our vision is quality care for all and quality care begins with infection prevention. And this buy-in from the top management actually resulted in two major policy changes within the organization. The first one was that all institutions in the CBC Health Services had to appoint an IPC nurse, which is done 
if you go to all the institutions, every institution has an IPC nurse who has been appointed with a letter of appointment, outlining what he or she has to do. And then all clinical staff had to carry alcohol being based hand rub in 100 mils containers in the pocket for use at point of care. So uh, uh, if you go around now, all of us, we have alcohol-based uh, hand rub containers, which we have to carry around when we are performing activities at the point of care. Those were the two very important policy changes that uh, were made. What is working now? What is working well? Surveillance, identification of outbreaks is key to prevention. Wherever you are working, it's very it's, it, it's important to be very vigilant because uh, outbreaks begin with identification. So identification is out of outbreaks is key to prevention. The next thing is training. Most of the staff working in the CPC health services have received trainings on hand hygiene, and that is actually working and helping to prevent uh, outbreaks. Provision of alcohol-based arrow. The, the CBC Health Services has a central pharmacy which is uh, responsible for producing, uh, supplying drugs and other medical supplies. And in addition, they're able to produce alcohol-based arrow and supply to all the institutions in the Cameroon Baptist Convention Health Services without interruption. So. We, we always have the supply. It's, you just need to requisition the amount you want and you receive. Then promotion. All the measures put in place to promote hand hygiene are working well. We have, we are celebrating the hand hygiene day. There are many other things we have done. We have posters, the multimodal strategy. Uh, we are trying to follow that and it's actually uh, working. And the foundation laid in 2020, the foundation that was laid in 2002, sorry, and in and in and the IPC culture in the staff of the CBC Health Services has also helped us in the prevention of COVID-19, because when COVID, when the outbreak of COVID-19 started, we were just reiterating, we're no longer. It was not like introducing hand hygiene, but it's something that has been doing and uh, uh, about 50 to 80 percent of staff working now have been trained on that. So at this point, we just had to be reminding that the hand hygiene is a very important aspect of preventing COVID-19. What was the conclusion? Neonatal sepsis in particular, the outbreak is preventable. It took active surveillance, training, availability of supplies and leadership to eliminate neonatal sepsis in Banso Baptist Hospital. Commitment and creativity are key to a successful IPC because the IPC team at that moment was actually committed and they were creative, especially as far as the supplies were concerned. So these are two factors that are very important for a successful IPC in, in any institutions. If we can take the example of Banso Baptist Hospital. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Erika. It was great. And uh, we will leave the questions um, at the end. I know there is some already. Um, I'm going to also now want to introduce Dr. Topin from the NASA unit. Um, I know she's got a different um, title. I just want to quickly get that up so I can introduce her properly. I've met her actually in 2009, 2019, when I was in uh, Nigeria, Abuja. Um, after they've um, contacted ICANN to um, come and do some training for them. And since then, you know, we were really um, so grateful that she was willing to present to us um, on Lassa Fever, as we want to just also move these webinars to show people that it's not just about COVID. Yes, COVID is very important, but there's other outbreaks as well. And we think it's very important that we need to look into that and also ensure that we are up to date with what is happening with um, uh, in our facilities. I'm going to hand over now to Dr. Topin. And Dr. Topin, you can actually share your screen and then just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. Good morning to everybody on this platform. I'm glad to be 
able to make my presentation. I'll share my screen. I hope my screen has come through. Yes, we can see it. You can Hello. see it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Dr. Ekaite Tobin. I'm a consultant public health physician with the ERA Specialist Teaching Hospital. And I'll be giving us a presentation on Lassa fever and COVID-19 in Nigeria. Reinforcing knowledge of Lassa fever and IPC practices among healthcare workers. This is the outline I'll follow. And the purpose, the objective of this presentation is to create the awareness of the possibilities of co epidemics and using our Nigerian experience with Lassa should be applied in health facilities to prevent the spread of infectious diseases, even though the, even those occurring as, um, at the same time. So even the core epidemics. Now, since COVID-19 was first reported in Wuhan, China, it had spread to it has spread to over 200 countries and territories. Some countries are experiencing co epidemics of COVID-19 and endemic infectious diseases with some cases of co-infections. And one of note is COVID-19 and dengue as has been reported in countries in Southeast Asia and South America. And the, pop, the topical, the fire on the, 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 the pot on the fire now out in Nigeria. Co-epidemics defined as the related spread of two or more infectious diseases pose a diagnostic and case management challenge, especially when presenting symptoms are similar. They have the potential to overwhelm the health system of the country, lead to increased morbidity and mortality among patients due to misdiagnosis and consequent delayed onset of treatment, and they increase community transmission because these misdiagnosed cases remain in the community. It is therefore very important that healthcare workers maintain not only a high index of suspicion for Lassa fever, but also adhere to standard precautions and all other measures they need to protect themselves, even in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. So let's talk a little bit about Lassa fever outbreaks in Nigeria. Lassa fever was first reported in Nigeria in 1969 in the last village called Lassa in the northeastern part of the country. So you see in the graph on the right, my left-hand side, before 1990, we just had about three states reporting Lassa fever. But as of last year, we have over 27 states out of the 36 states in the country reporting at least one confirmed case. The outbreaks of Lassa fever in Nigeria occur with all year. So we have Lassa fever all year round, with seasonal peaks between November and March. Since 2017, outbreaks have increased in magnitude until 2020. So if you look at the chart above, you will see that in 2017, which is the blue line, the line graph was low, but all across the years, you see a gradual increase in the magnitude of the outbreaks. And if you look at 2021 and 2020, the gray line, you will see that the number of cases I have stated here exceeded all the previous years. So from 308 confirmed cases in 2017 and 2020. And as at week one to buy, at the end of week 21, I'm sorry, Dr. Taupin, we've lost you. We have so far confirmed 286 cases of Lassa fever in the country. Sorry, Dr. Taupin. Um, Still voice... talking about the outbreaks. There is no... Sorry, Dr. Taupin, can you hear me? Sorry, Dr. Taupin. Dr. Tobin, I'm sorry. 
Dr. Topin. I'm sorry, your voice is breaking and it's not moving on as it should. If we can maybe just, um, there you are, now it's going back. Hello, I can hear you. Yeah, your voice is breaking a little bit. I'm sorry, she just dropped off. I'm sure she'll be back on. Um, we're very sorry for that break and the interruption. Um, I'm sure she will be coming back on just now. Uh, while we wait, I just want to reiterate if we can just please keep our cameras off and ensuring that our um, microphones is also muted. Thank you very much for the great amount of people that are joining from all over. We just want to give a, a minute or two to just rejoin. I see there is um, a lot of people that um, put in the chat box where they are coming from. Welcome to all of you. Just please remember there's a Q&A box if you want to ask any questions from the presenters. Uh, we can address that as well. And at the end, there will be some time for you to be answered in person. Um, so we're just waiting for Dr. Tobin to come back on. We can just check that she's coming back in. Susan, are you still there? Can you hear me? If we can just maybe check that Dr. Tobin is coming back on. While we are still waiting for her, I just want to also welcome the panel. I see Silas is also here from Africa CDC. Dr. Yuande is also here and she will handle the questions and answers at the end. Um, we want to thank you everybody and be very sorry for this break in the interruption. Um, we're just trying to get Dr. Tobin back. Um, the presentations will be made available at the end to all of you. And then just I want to remind you for next week as well. Um, and next week we will be discussing um, injection safety, shops and waste management. Um, and then we're looking forward to the next series that's also coming. So we want you all to please engage with us. If there's any burning topics that you think we want or you need us to discuss, please send us an email or um, on the community of practice on Telegram. And we can take it up from there to see how we can help you guys and, and take this forward. So please also look onto the Africa CDC and ICANN website for all the new guidelines that has been developed and published. Um, it's quite wonderful to see all the great Africa content there that we can use in our facilities as well. Um, I'm going to um, try and just hand over to Dr. Wanda while we're waiting for Dr. Topin to come back um, if there's any questions and I know there's two at the moment in the question and answer box maybe we can handle that in the meantime thank you Dr. Wande Dr. Wande can you hear me Wonder, are you there? Um, it seems like they've also got a problem. While we're waiting for them to join, I'm just I see there's some hands raised as well. Um, I just want to mention to you guys it's very difficult for us to answer raised hands. If you can please maybe put your question in the chat on the, in the question and answer box and we can handle it from there. It will help us a lot. While we're waiting for Dr. Tobin to please join us again, I'm just going to open up the questions and answers. And these are to Erica. Um, they've asked, how did you ensure compliance to healthcare providers in regards to implementation of the IPC measures? Erica, if you can maybe answer this. 
Just unmute yourself. Erica, can you hear me? I'm sorry, can you please all indicate if you can hear us? Yes, Erica. Hello. Did you hear yes. the question, Erica? Yes. Are you getting me now? Yes, I'm getting you now. Yes. The, uh, sorry, what, what? sorry, Erica, don't worry. Uh, we've got Dr. Topin back. So we're going to yes. allow her to talk and then we will get back to you on the questions. Okay. I'm so sorry. It's raining here. So the network was interrupted. It's raining heavy here. So sorry no, about worry. that. You can please carry on. Thank you. Okay. So I was talking about the about the Lassa fever outbreaks in Nigeria. And I said there are no age or sex preferences when persons in endemic areas where housing conditions are poor and sanitation is poor are at risk. Communities where rodents are haunted for food are at risk and healthcare workers. Now for COVID-19 pandemic in Nigeria, the first confirmed case was an Italian citizen in Lagos, who tested positive on the 27th of February. The second case was reported on the 9th of March, and a Nigerian who had contact with the index case. As at yesterday, the country has reported record 2,180,444 suspected cases, 166,816 confirmed cases, with 2,117 deaths. Now, if we look at last and COVID, um, uh, epidemics, life epidemic and COVID, present COVID pandemic. And we take the data from the COVID and Lassa Fever Treatment Center located in the Lassa Fever endemic state, which is where I based, the rural specialist in hospital. We'll see in the bar charts that in 2020, we had 1,813 cases of COVID-19. And in 2021, we, our laboratory diagnosed 4,000 424 cases of COVID-19. The same for Lassa. In 2020, our laboratory confirmed 789 um, samples of uh, Lassa fever. And in 2021, between epidemic 1 and 21, 208 cases. So you see, we are we were, we confirmed 1.5% and 2.8% of COVID-19 and Lassa fever cases in the country. Now, a little bit about co-infections. Co-infections, as I said earlier, can present a diagnostic, a diagnostic dilemma. Why? Let me discuss the... Hello, Dr. are you with me? We're not seeing your screen. So um, we're hearing you well, but we're not seeing your screen. Do you want me to maybe rather share, then it might help with your bandwidth? Okay, please, thank you. Okay, so you can just stop sharing, then I will share um, my screen. So if you can just please stop sharing on your side, then I can share. Yes, I've stopped. I've stopped. Okay. It doesn't allow me yet at the moment, so let's just try again. I'm sorry for the technical issues. Let me just try again. Okay, there we've got your screen now. So I think you can go ahead, Dr. Tobin. Okay. I use, I hope everybody can see the screen because I can't, but I'll present from the screen. So we're looking at massa fever, a co-infections, and I'll present the case of a 72-year-old male retiree, a known diabetic and hypertensive, living in an endemic community in the state. He presented at my facility, ISH, in 2020, a five-day history of fever, temperature greater than 38 degrees. His temperature was actually 38.2, but he kept sleeping. He became chest pain and generalized body pain. He was treated for malaria, and, but did not get any relief. He tested positive COVID-19 by PCR and was managed as a mild case of COVID-19 using azithromycin, zinc, and ivermectin. Three days later, he returned with a fever of 38 degrees centigrade 
and the fasting blood sugar of 257 milligrams per deciliter. He was admitted, and because he's also, you know, in the Lassa fever endemic area, we tested him for Lassa fever and he turned out positive. So he was treated for Lassa fever and COVID 19. Next slide, please. Next so slide. This is your slide, your screen still, Dr. Tobin. Um, it's frozen at the moment. So if you can maybe just double check, I've asked Africa CDC platform to just maybe allow me to also share the screen. Um, because then I can do that. Can you see my screen now? No, it's still your facing. Can you see anything now? No, but if others are seeing, I can try to move the slide from my end while you, uh, we could use the slide number and I just move the slide to you. My slide here as I'm presenting with you. Anna, it looks like we're still seeing Dr. Tobin's screen. I'm okay, let's look. can you see my screen now? Yes, um, I've stopped us. Um, I can see your screen now, Anna. Over All right. Let me know if I'm on the right one, then I can move it forward and backwards for you, Dr. Tobin. So I'm on slide 11 now. Okay, let me just look at so, slide 11. Let me just move forward to slide 11. There was your the definition and the impact on public health. Yes, yes. So last of people, I'll go quickly from here. It's an acute and sometimes severe viral branch fever. It's endemic in Nigeria, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. We do have, an it's estimated to cost 100,000 to 300,000 infections per year with approximately 5,000 deaths. Incubation period is 4 to 21 days. 80% of patient persons infected are asymptomatic. Lassa fever accounts for 6 to 15% of fever illnesses presenting in endemic areas and as much as 10 to 15% of hospital admissions. Overall case fatality is about 1%, but it may rise to 20% amongst hospitalized patients during outbreaks. The reservoir is a multi mammate rat called Mastomis natalensis. It is recognized by its multiple breasts on the ventral surface and hairless tip. It's a peridomestic rodent that breeds all year round. The young are infected at birth and carry the virus for life. The virus is also shed in the urine and feces. Slide, slide 13 now, please. Causative agents. Last fever is caused by an enveloped RNA virus that is genetically diverse, but with four lineages well known. Lineages one, two, and three circulate in Nigeria. Lineage four is circulating in Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. Slide 14, please. Primary last fever is transmitted among the rodent population, but then you have zoonotic spillover to humans. So primary transmission is from rodents to humans through ingestion of contaminated food or water or eating with contaminated, your contaminated utensils, or is through contact with household items or surfaces contaminated with the urine or excreta of infected rats. Secondary transmission follows human, which is human to human transmission, follows direct contact with blood tissues or secretions from infected persons in relation of aerosolized viruses and sexual transmissions. Next slide, slide 15, please. In healthcare settings, Transmission occurs through unprotected contact with contaminated medical equipment, accidental nail stick injuries, and unprotected contact with soil bedding, patient care material, and body fluids. Slide 16, please. So if we look at last fever and symptom and, and COVID-19, symptoms are very similar, especially at early stage. So with COVID just as Lassa, you have fever, but the fever in Lassa is very high grade. So you have high grade fever that doesn't respond to antibiotics or antimalarials. But you have all the other conventional symptoms, abdominal pain, chest pain, difficulty with breathing, weakness, anorexia, which you also see with COVID-19. Then Lassa fever, by the end of the first week, the patient starts, if without, without any treatment, the patient develops swelling of the face and neck, bleeding from the mucosal surfaces, and by the 14th day, enters into a coma and dies, untreated, untreated. Slide 17. We have suspect case, probable and confirmed case definitions, which are applied for surveillance. So a suspect case is any patient more than with a temperature of 38 degrees and above, 
Over, within three to 21 days, with one of these symptoms, vomiting, barrier, sore throat, muscle pain, abnormal bleeding, or abdominal pain. Slide 18, please. Now, why is it important to maintain infection prevention and control in healthcare facilities during these outbreaks? Because nosocomial outbreaks have been attributed to poor compliance by, with APC, uh, poor compliance to APC practices by healthcare workers. So in 2018, in the 2018 Lassa fever outbreak, we had 43 healthcare workers infected. In 2019, we had 18 healthcare workers. In 2020, we had 47 healthcare workers. So protection of the healthcare workers starts with screening of suspected cases and prompt referral to confirmed, uh, of confirmed cases to dedicated treatment facilities. Next slide, please. Um, during outbreaks, healthcare facilities should have a dedicated triad area and entrance to identify potential cases that come to seek care. And trial, triage should follow STEAM approach, which implies, which is an acronym for screening, isolation, and notification. So you screen the individual for latter fever, to isolate from other patients, and you notify appropriate authorities. Next slide, please. Screening should take place at the facility entry points or as close as possible to the entrance. The area should be staffed with professionals trained on basic IPC principles and the use of a standard algorithm. The staff in the triage area should wear a scrub suit, a gown, examination gloves, and a screen, and use a standardized screening tool. Next slide, please. We should observe a no-touch policy during screening, so that means including taking temperature using an infrared thermometer, and patients with wet symptoms should be put in place in a separate waiting room, provided a face mask and disposable tissues, and taught how to carry out respiratory hygiene. Good hygiene facilities should be available just as posters and triage algorithms should be displayed. Patients who don't meet the suspect's case definition should be allowed to access care within the facility. Next slide, please. For patients who meet case definition, they should be moved to a holding area where they will further be evaluated. The specimen will be collected for Lassa fever. And of course, it must be managed under strict IPC. So a single person holding area is recommended with at least 1.5 meters between the patients and healthcare workers able to and made to comply with the five moments of hand hygiene. They must wear the appropriate PPE. So they wear double gloves, gowns, masks, eye protection, um, wear covered footwear and hair clothing. The holding area should also have its own toilet and hand washing stations and um, posters for hand hygiene, respiratory etiquette. This will be displayed. Cleaning and disinfection should follow standard protocol. Next slide. The last um, letter in the acronym scene is notify. So you notify appropriate local public health authorities, the state epidemiologists, the surveillance officers. You don't wait for elaborate confirmation before you notify. Next slide, please. So when we talk about the treatment center, because we have you can see a suspect case in a general health, um, a public facility, maybe a primary or secondary level health facility, but then we have dedicated treatment centers across the country. So confirmed cases should be moved to the dedicated treatment center, Lassa fever treatment center. And the objective is so that they can be better managed, better provided quality care, and the environment is We lost Hello. you, Doctor. I'm, I'm here. I'm here now. Okay. Okay. So I have, can you see me? I just have one slide to go. Hello, Anna. Yes. Can I continue? Yes, you can continue. So. Okay. So all confirmed cases should be moved to a dedicated Lassa fever treatment center. Yeah. And my conclusion. Please go to the previous slide. So poor epidemics of Lassa fever. No. Four epidemics of Lassa fever and COVID-19 occurred in Nigeria in 2020 and even in this year. Now, with the global force on COVID-19, Lassa infections are bound to be missed. Healthcare workers therefore need to maintain a high index of suspicion of Lassa fever as well as COVID-19. Hello, Anna. Yes, you can continue. Sorry, we've lost you again, Doctor. Yes, no, that's the last slide. That's the uh, last slide. 
And yes, thank you very much. The next slide, thank you for listening. The next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes, I'm getting there. Thank you so much for listening. I'm so sorry about the network challenges, please. It's really raining over here. No problem. Thank over. you, Dr. Dothman. Thank you very much. This was great. And I think um, a lot of people, you can see there's a lot of um, questions as well. We are really grateful for your time and we do understand the technical issues as well. It will be made available to everybody that's on the call, so you don't need to worry. We will make sure that all of you get hold of these presentations. I'm going to hand over to Dr. Wande, which will take us to, to the question and answers. Thank you, Dr. Wande. Thanks so much, Anna. And um, good afternoon, good morning, um, colleagues, um, depending on where you're joining in from. Um, as Anna has said, um, please keep your questions coming. Um, use the Q&A box. It might be difficult to um, find questions on the on the chat box. So please put your questions on the Q&A box. And um, as you know, we are all familiar with how uh, power cuts and rain affects um, our internet. Um, so kindly bear with us. Um, the slides will be available and the recordings will also be available um, um, to you after this um, session. So we'll start with Erica. You have a question um, and it's around ensuring compliance to healthcare worker, healthcare providers in regards to implementation of IPC. Um, um, if you can talk about how you were able to ensure that every healthcare provider was um, adhering to IPC measures. Just unmute yourself, Erica. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, talking about compliance, uh, the basically the multimodal strategy was used. Uh, for example, for system change, uh, there was availability of alcohol-based pan rope. Like I said, local production actually started when that outbreak was identified and it was placed on procedure trays and trolleys to be pushed around. So uh, uh, it was uh, the availability of alcohol-based hand rub was ensured. And I talk about the improvision of things where hand washing points were, were, were manufactured using uh, buckets. And then there was training and retraining and then with the institution of the IPC nurse, uh, the IPC nurse, one of the functions is to monitor the compliance. So he, he was actually constantly in the unit, ensuring that uh, uh, what was put in place was being followed. And those who were behind, those who, could not, who were not catching up, he, was, he had one-on-one -on -one training. I talked, uh, one of the strategies was on training was one-on-one. -on -one. I talked about one-on-one. -on -one. So those who were be behind, he was actually taking them one-on-one. -on -one. So there was that availability of supplies and they, they, especially in that unit, they were closely following up since the outbreak was identified in the unit. I don't know if the answer is satisfactory. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for that. Um, I think there's another question around um, 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 for you um, is um, what were the what are the causes you found from nurses um, practices to facilitate? Um, so I think this person wants to know what the causes are from the nurses um, that um, that caused um, um, sepsis. Um, the question is not quite clear, Samir um, Mohamed. If you'd like to. Um, share that again, uh, and what what um, step of IPC um, or what measure? I guess what um, 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 what IPC measure in your hospice in your hospital did you find find to be weak? I think that's what the question um, um, is trying to say. So over to you, Erica, uh, and then we will move to um, uh, Dr. Tobin. Just need to unmute yourself, Erica. 
Hello. Yes, we can hear you now. Yes, I'm saying that from the, the side of the nurses, I mentioned there was actually a lack of knowledge because most of the nurses at that point had not been trained on basic IPC, basic IPC practices. So they, 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 they were sharing of items amongst children, regardless of infection status. Because for example, for bathing, all of the, the children were, were took their bath in the same bowl and we use the same soap and the same uh, body lotion for all the children. And there was no proper hand hygiene between the children. And the next thing is that uh, there was inadequate disinfection of items between use. I mentioned that uh, instead of using 0.5% chlorine to disinfect those items that were used and reused, 0.05% chlorine was used. That was another factor from the nurse's side. But like I said, it's all bundled under a knowledge deficit or lack of knowledge because before then they had not been trained. And the curriculum in Cameroon, even up to now with, with um, the awareness about IPC, there's still so many training schools that don't, don't, don't there's no subject as IPC. So then you can imagine in 2002, when the concept was still very new, especially in our country. So I can just say uh, on the nurse, nurse's point of view, lack of knowledge. But with the training, we saw that there was improvement. That's why by 2006, those outbreaks, those frequent outbreaks were eliminated. That's to show that they were actually trained. They actually gained knowledge and then they put that knowledge into practice. And the second part, I'm sorry, I, uh, what was the second part of the question? It was around, um, just a second, um, um, I think I, I failed to understand what this person has typed and I've requested that it should be sent again. Uh, but it, I, I suspect um, what you found from the nurses that facilitated um, um, sepsis transmission. And the next one was um, IPC measures that you consider weak in your hospital. Okay. At that point, at that point, uh, one of the factors was we, we do not have hand washing facilities. Like I said, there was just one thing for, tets, for, a, de for a 30 bed unit, meaning if you were to be walking and this and sink is uh, around bed one, if you're on bed 30, <laughs> you need to come back to bed one, which is at times due to time and so on. It's practically some people will just let go and hygiene. So there, there was no availability of what was needed to perform hand hygiene. And the staff were not trained on hand hygiene. And even alcohol-based hand rub was not there. It is when this, the outbreaks were identified that the IPC team at that time started producing alcohol-based hand rub locally. So I'm sure those were the main facility factors. If I understood the question well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I know that if the participants have more questions, they will come to you. Thank you, Erica. Um, Dr. Tobin, I think um, the next um, few questions will be for you. Um, um, the first question is, what is the treatment for Lassa fever? For the question, Lassa fever is treated with Ribavirin. So uh, we use Ribavirin to treat patients with Lassa fever. What we do is we start them on a start dose of having Ribavirin and treatment is for 10 days. We may, if, depending on if they are PCR negative at the point of discharge, at the point of uh, when they recover, if they, if they still remain PCR negative, after the 10 days treatment, we send them home. If they are, if they are still positive, we send them home on oral rebarbing. But the treatment is standard treatment is rebarbing. We then supportive care. A lot of IV fluids, a lot of monitoring input and intake and outtake, a lot of um, making sure that they are, they are, they are 
They, are, they have adequate diet and nutrition is um, adequate. They eat well so that they can recover well. Primarily support them. They are good nursing care. Over. Thanks very much. Uh, the next question is for you, and it's on, is there any point of care diagnostic tool to differentiate between Lassa fever and COVID-19 at presentation? Um, because uh, both um, share similar symptoms. So uh, it will also be interesting to know if you've got like a um, beyond a diagnostic tool, perhaps a, a, a checklist or two um, 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 during triage um, to help your differentials. Yes, we have screening tools. So screening tools contain standard information, your symptoms. Have trouble, have you been in contact with anybody who has been confirmed a case of Lassa, well, COVID as the case may be. Then in this, we do have a rapid test kit, Lassa fever, but because the lineages are so diverse, you will get a, last, a kit that will be able to recognize the three uh, lineages in Nigeria it has really been the challenge. But as at, uh, presently, the HG Center of Excellence for Genomic Studies has developed a rapid test kit for Lassa fever that can pick all lineages. But I think they're still at the stage of um, evaluation and um, field evaluation and trying to get registration in the country. For COVID, with the size of the pandemic, there are in country rapid test kits that have been developed, that have been. Rapid test kits have been developed and brought into the country, but again, they are still being validated in under field conditions. So they are uh, test kits, but at different stages of, they're not rolled out. So primarily diagnosis still is made based on the PCR. Over. Uh, th thank you very much um, for that. Um, so I think uh, uh, we will um, take some questions uh, uh, for Erica. Um, this question is really, um, um, I think our colleague has had a previous experience and, and I will read as, um, as um, I've seen. I remember meeting a strange scenario in a pediatric hospital I covered. The neonate went home good, but subsequently came back after developing a bowl-like sore on their lower extremities. I suspected infection of the ICU. I used, um, I'm guessing this is bleach, um, and cleaned all the equipment, including the cots and the infection stopped. So the question to you is, is it possible to keep the NICU absolutely gently? Um, over to you, Erica. Come again. That is it possible to... Keep the NICU absolutely germ-free. <laughs> uh, that's a uh, uh, We know that when we talk about asepsis, aseptic technique, and so on, asepsis actually means free of microorganisms. But we know that that's theoretical because there's no point where you can keep an environment of uh, gem free completely. What we always do in IPC is that we want to reduce the number of microbes to the barest minimum because we know infections will come because of the number and maybe virulence. So we, we, we cannot say there is any point that the environment can actually be microorganism, can be free from microorganisms, so whether pathogenic or non-pathogenic. But IPC steps in to bring measures, to put in place measures that will be able to reduce those microorganisms to the barest minimums. In many institutions, they, 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 there's usually disinfection of the eyes of the neonatal units. But so long as somebody enters there, <laughs> there's already microorganisms from the respiratory tract, skin shedding, and so on and so forth. So no matter uh, the measures we put in place, our goal is to reduce the, those microorganisms to the barest minimum such that in case uh, the patient is exposed to any of them, it will not be, the number will not be sufficient to cause an infection. We should be in such a way that the immune system of the individual will be able to fight. I don't know. I'm talking from our perspective in Africa. Maybe some other developed settings, or maybe some countries may have other ideas. Or 
Maybe some people may have other ideas about this. Thank you. Um, um, Anna, Elizabeth, um, any comments around um, keeping um, um, the NICU um, gem free? I think just from my side, um, one day that, uh, like Erica said, it is very difficult. It's difficult to get any place completely um, gem free. Uh, it depends on, you know, if you have an isolation unit or anything like that. But even in that instance, so, you know, I think um, it's very difficult, even if you go to a CSSD where they're sterilized um, as well. So I don't know if um, Elizabeth wants to say anything, but from our side as well, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult. And I won't say impossible, but very difficult. Thank you, Over. Yeah, hi, it's, it's Elizabeth Bancroft here. And apologies for joining late. Um, yeah, it's 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 it really is impossible to get something germ free. I mean, partly because our bodies contain a lot of germs that are actually uh, useful. Um, you know, there's a lot of germs, a lot of E. coli, for example, in our guts that is actually useful um, to uh, to help digest food. Um, we have a lot of pathogens on our body, um, on our skin, uh, staff and strep that live with us, uh, just coexist with us uh, peacefully. And um, we probably don't want to try to get rid of all of those germs. And so we carry those germs with us anyway into a NICU, uh, into wherever we're working. And um, babies themselves actually have germs um, where they have their own um their own E. coli, their own uh, set of germs in their gut that's helping them digest food. So in that sense, we're always going to have germs around. Uh, the only way of sort of keeping something completely germ-free is perhaps um, perhaps something like, uh, if you've ever seen those movies, uh, Boys in the Bubble, you, you know, something like that, where, so where somebody has a completely... Um, completely wrecked immune system and really cannot uh, stand up, has immune system that, that cannot handle um, a being surrounded with any pathogenic germ. And then even then they're basically locked uh, behind these plastic, unbelievable, you know, uh, situations uh, lack, well, behind plastic, behind glass, nobody can come in, nobody can touch them. Um, they're completely sort of separated from the world. And then you can reduce the amount of germs, but even then the person will still have germs themselves. Again, like we're talking about the germs that help you uh, digest food. This is one of the reasons why if you ever have a bad case of, uh, of you know, diarrhea, for example, um, and you actually uh, lose a lot of the germs that are in your uh, gut from the bad case of diarrhea, sometimes it takes a little while for you to repopulate those germs. And, um, and that's one of the reasons why we, we suggest that you eat bland food after getting really sick to your stomach um, in order to make it easier to digest whatever food that you are taking in, because you've actually reduced the amount of germs uh, to almost too low in your gut. So it's basically to say you could you can reduce the number of germs. You can certainly reduce the number of pathogenic germs in a in a NICU or any area, but it's very 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 hard to get uh, things down to absolutely zero, um, and you don't always want to get things down to absolutely zero. Over. Um, fantastic. Thank you very much, Anna and um, Elizabeth. I think we will move to the next round of questions. Uh, and this is something I know that we will all be able to speak about beyond uh, um, disease outbreaks um, uh, and um, uh, from our experience with COVID. Um, it's on what should be done when PPEs are exhausted. Should healthcare providers um, source for PPEs for their personal use? Uh, uh, this question has come up, so um, um, I will open the floor to my speakers um, right after I give um, um, a sort of a feedback. So from the Africa CDC perspective, ideally, um, it is our it is um, it is the responsibility of administrators, help, um, um, national government to ensure that healthcare providers have at every point adequate um, um, PPEs. Um, it, it, um, we understand that, uh, of course, um, at some point during the first wave, there were global shortages of, of PPE, and at some point we had to make considerations for reusing um, PPE. 
our strategy has really been to ensure that at every point of, of this out of this pandemic that all countries have um, received either true donation or true uh, a pooled procurement, we have been able to adequately distribute um, PPE um, to all of the 55 uh, uh, member states uh, on the continent to ensure that our healthcare um, workers are, are are fully covered. I think one of the all, all, one of the considerations for this is at some point during the um, pandemic and at the onset of the pandemic. Um, Everyone, uh, many healthcare workers didn't understand what to be used. So they wanted the full thing. And, and we started to see a lot of wastage um, um, when not necessary. So we have put out some guidance around um, um, PPE to be used at every sort of setting um, um, when dealing with patients, contact tracing, um, um, doing ambulatory testing and things like that so that we are able to ensure that um, even so health workers have um, used their PPE responsibly. Uh, we've also put out um, uh, an advisory to guide uh, uh, health workers around reusing um, 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 PPE for the ones that can actually be reused. We've given evidence-based um, um, guidance on this. So um, that's just to um, give an Africa CDC perspective. Uh, Erica uh, and Tobin, if you would like to go, then I'll move to Anna and Elizabeth. Okay. That question is actually very tricky. <laughs> uh, like you said, provision of PPE is the responsibility of the administration where you work. But if uh, for any reason uh, the PPEs are not available, what I always advise is that the PPEs are personal protective. Means the main aim is to protect yourself. Should you rather contract COVID-19 because you were not provided a mask for maybe 200 or 500 francs CFA in our context, or should you expose yourself? If it comes to that extreme case that your administration is unable to prevent, to provide for whatever reason, if you are able to provide and maybe uh, ask for reimbursement later or follow up any other thing later, for me, for me, I'll advise you, you protect yourself first before you can uh, be following up with the administration, if you are able to, because uh, especially in the healthcare setting, maybe you can't leave a patient suffering and you cannot tell the patient, I cannot work on you because I don't have PPE. That's even not uh, within our uh, code of conduct as healthcare pre personnel, but if you must work on them, you also have to be healthy and you also have to be protected. So if I'm to, like I said, the question is tricky, but if, I, if I'm if i faced with a real life situation and I'm asked to advise somebody, I will say if you are able to buy, buy and protect yourself before any other steps or bu uh, bureaucratic steps to follow up to, to, to recover may come. That's <laughs> that's what I can say about that question. Thank you very much, Erica. And, and it's really good to hear that perspective, um, particularly um, from the um, healthcare facility level perspective. That That is a really interesting perspective. Tobin? Yes, I would say events. Really, really, the hospital management working in conjunction with federal and state governments should be able to, on whatever um, um, system of government is in place in the country, should make every effort to make these available. But then, as Erica said, you, there are some PPEs you can buy, you know, with your money if the hospital doesn't make it available to protect yourself. But there are some you just cannot afford. Whereas we who work in a Lassa fever treatment center, we go in with full body, I mean, we wear our corporates. Now, this, the cost of one is nothing less than uh, for 5,000 naira, if I can say, $100. So, and you go in, even if you integrate your tasks, you go in and do as much as you can do and come out, you will still need to go in again. I mean, for maybe the afternoon, to the afternoon round. So, how much you can be spying corrupts with your, uh, from your pocket? 
So that, uh, in 2019, 2018 outbreak, we ran out of um, PPEs. We then had to look inward, and it was a challenge getting from government and getting where, where, where that federal and state level. So we had to look inward, and hospital management, we started showing our cover -ups. Hello. Hello. Um, I think you're muted. Oh, yes. No, no, no. I, 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 was, I was disconnected. Okay. So uh, we had to start sewing for roles because this was the only thing to do. I mean, we couldn't ask nurses and doctors to go and spend $100, $100 just to buy overall to enter Swiss to see a confirmed case of Lassa fever. So there's an extent to which the individual can pull money from his pocket to protect himself if management is not forthcoming. That also means that budgeting and then, um, you know, proper uh, connection with governments to make sure that your stock keeping is right and you on time, you know, you make your requisitions on time so that that can tell you where you don't, um, you run out of um, PPEs is completely abolished. I think PPEs will be bought for them to. Um, I, I think we lost um, Dr. Tobin. Um, so I think um, if okay, we'll just move to the sort of other questions because I see that people are, are, are bringing in um, uh, more questions. Um, well, I'm sorry, if I may um, address uh, just very briefly that question though. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you, just very briefly. Um, I, I know that um, running out of PPE, especially at the beginning of this pandemic, was a, a really big issue and, and still can be a big issue. One of the things I would suggest is um, I, I appreciate very much the point of view, which is, you know, make sure you get it for yourself if you can, you know, even if you have to do it out of pocket in order to, um, in order to uh, uh, protect yourself. The other thing you can do, though, is work with... The, um, the hospital administration to really try to maximize the amount of environmental and administrative controls that can be used to reduce the chance that you would be exposed, um, you know, or significantly exposed when you're taking care of a patient. So maximizing the amount of ventilation, for example, in a room, really rethinking, uh, you know, a room with a patient that might be contagious, really rethinking um, who needs to go into the room how can it be streamlined? How can you um, put the tasks that all need to be done with the patient who's uh, contagious? You know, make sure to do them all at once instead of having to go back in and out of the room several times where in theory you're supposed to change PPE, uh, you know, potentially each time. So thinking about ways of, you know, cohorting um, uh, patients that need, uh, that, that are highly contagious, cohorting them, putting them in one area um, and reducing the number of healthcare workers that actually have to attend to those patients when you're running out of PPE. So there's other um, there's other potential modalities that can be used to try to, in addition to PPE, that can try to reduce your your exposure to pathogens. And those should be maximized. I mean, they should be maximized all the time, but particularly during the time when there is uh, very little PPE available. Over. Th thanks very much. Um, um, Erica, this question is for you um, because I think we've got just a few more minutes for Q&A. Um, what have you done to sustain the status of neonatal sepsis elimination in your facility? Have you experienced other outbreaks in the hospital? Okay. Uh, since 2006, we have not had any out outbreak of, of neonatal sepsis in the unit. Uh, the measures that were put in place uh, are, are being put in place. That actually gave birth to IPC in the Cameroon Baptist Convention as a whole from that experience. And from there, there have been so many trainings on infection prevention and so on. There have been so many of them. And when we have new staff and they're coming in, our training school also does that 
training school headed by Mustang Kwan Jacob. So there's uh, there is an, a lot of knowledge or awareness about IPC now. So since 2006, there has not been any outbreak. And those measures are, are, are there. It's a rule. We don't share any item. When you're coming to the hospital, you buy your items. If your baby has to take a bath, we bathe your baby, use a bowl, and we keep for disinfection later, and then take a new bowl for each baby. We All those uh, measures are in place. We have injection safety measures put in place, one injection for one patient. So there are many more things that have even been added as the trainings are being improved every day. So since then, we have not had any outbreak of neonatal sepsis in the maternity unit. Thank you. Um, Tobin, this is for you. Is there any relationship or association between COVID-19 and Lassa fever? Um, and our participant is from Uganda, but has not had uh, any symptoms. Um, 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 it's more or less COVID um, in their case. Uh, and um, um, another question would be, if you can take these two questions at once, are there any recorded cases of Lassa fever out of the usual or the endemic zone? So over to you. Okay, thank you. I hope my internet doesn't break. They are, we have Lhasa all year round, but there are three endemic states in the country where we record Lhasa fever all year round. For the other states, we have the seasonal peaks. That's the first question. Three states are three to five, five states, but three are very high and burden states. The other two are not too high. But for all the other key states, it's really during outbreak periods. That's the first question. The second, COVID and Lassa are very similar, though they are both zoonotic diseases. Lassa is spread by the Mastomis uh, statilensis rodent, and it's primarily human uh, rodent to human transmission. COVID started as, um, uh, as zoonotic, but then secondary transmission, human to human, is actually what has spread it around the world. So they are very different in that sense. And the clinical presentations are very similar. Though so the fever in Lhasa can be, you know, are very high. You can have up to 39, 40 degrees centigrade. While in COVID, and then you don't have the anosmia and um, the side symptoms you have. You don't have the hemorrhage you see in Lhasa fever. Lhasa fever, by the time they're in their second week, already bleeding from all the orifices, even um, control sites. You know, you have you put on a cannula and then they start bleeding from there. So that is it. And then um, COVID is primarily spread by droplets, but um, Lassa, you do have contact, and so you need contact and droplet precautions for Lassa. Yes, though so COVID, yes, spread by hands, but not as much as I mean Lassa, once you just touch anybody with your um, unprotected, you know, it spreads very easily. Over. Fantastic, thank you. Um, the next question again is for you. 80% of 80 patients with Lassa fever are asymptomatic. How do we uh, make sure that, how, I think this person wants to know that how do we make sure at the very early onset that it's Lassa fever, not COVID-19 or any other disease? Um, does Lassa fever have um, RDT? RDT is not available. Uh, commercially, but they're still being um, tested in a particular institution that is helping the country develop the priorities. So, differentiating COVID and Lassa, COVID, especially in non endemic states, Lassa is seasonal. So, by the time you see patients coming with uh, with cough, fever, uh, and cough is not really so much a feature of Lassa, it's actually body pains, fever, vomiting, weakness. And um, and they know you know this is not the time. I mean, we're not in the season. We're not. This is not the peak time when you have Lassa. Then you can begin to think of COVID. Otherwise, uh, you just have to keep an open mind, keep maintain a high index of suspicion for the time. particularly during outbreak seasons, and particularly when you're in endemic states. You just have to think about it. But then again, a lot of people will be so mild they won't even go to the facility. They just get there. With a few anti antipyretics, yes, over. 
Thank you very much. Um, um, one last question for Erica, then we'll come back to you, Dr. Tobin, because you've got about three questions to take. Um, I think this question is for you, Erica. Is the case fatality rates um, among hospitalized cases uh, um, difficult to count? Um, um, this participant will probably need to send this question again because um, um, it's not clear. Is the case fatality rate among hospitalized cases? Um, 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 apologies. Um, 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 for the participant who sent this question, please kindly send it um, before we wrap up the Q&A. So back to you, Dr. Tobin. Um, um, a few questions. What is the indication for double glove, gloving for healthcare workers uh, looking after patients with uh, Lassa fever? And um, if, from your experience, uh, what IPC measures uh, for co uh, and um, for co epidemics, um, um, dengue fever and COVID, or any other known fever? Thank you. So when we enter the, we have we double deal before we enter the NASA ward. We find out that even at the time when we're um, inside the ward and we have to do a procedure, we just pull out the first glove, perform hand hygiene, take out the first one, perform hand hygiene and replace before we go to the next patient. Also, when we're doffing, after performing the first hand hygiene, we take off the first one, then we start doffing. Uh, the last one, the, the inner glove, the inner glove will be the last one we take out before we come out. So if we don't do this, sometimes you're in a Lassa ward, you have a patient who has just starts bleeding or starts vomiting, you get you, your hands get stained, you have to take off that glove, but you have the inner one as well. So that you're able to immediately perform hand hygiene. And if you're not, if your guard coverall is not stained or your apron is Um, Dr. Tobin, we lost you. So, there really is whatever standard precautions are standard. Precautions. We found out that the measures we have applied for COVID, so we standardly apply for trial and um, for LASA, were still very helpful. I mean, we still use them for COVID. So we didn't really need to do anything extra. I'm talking about my center in particular. We didn't really need to do anything extra. You know, for COVID, because we already have those measures in place in the Lassa Fever, Fever Treatment Center for Lassa. Thank you. Thank you. And one final question um, for you before we wrap up. Uh, what is the average turnaround time for lab tests to confirm Lassa Fever infections? So during, um, when we're in the inter-epidemic periods, usually about 24 hours, but by the time we enter the peak, the when by the time we enter the outbreak periods between December to March, April, we get as many as two hundred samples in a day. So turnaround time can actually take up to three hours, three, depending on load volume of um, samples coming in. Yeah, but usually on the average twenty-four hours. Thank you. Okay, so um, finally, uh, um, before I hand over. Uh, to Anna, um, um, this question is really uh, it's really something that is concerning to all of us across the continent. Uh, the current surge in COVID-19 cases is worrisome. What can be done to mitigate the situation? And um, so I think I, I will be happy to take that. Um, um, I think um, we can all agree that um, as soon as um, we started to roll out um, um, the vaccines, many people... Um, um, despite the fact that we're not seeing many people come out to take their vaccines, the ones who have taken it or are planning to are getting a bit more relaxed. It seems like um, the end is right now. And many people are no longer taking into consideration public health and social measures. We are seeing uh, uh, countries and, and communities opening up very quickly, uh, uh, looking around issues around masking and washing. It almost seems like everyone is um, just ready to stop.
what we have been preaching for the past year. So I think uh, as IPC folks and healthcare workers, it is our role to keep reiterating this messaging. We know that people have heard it over and over again. I think we, we now need to be innovative in how we, we message it. Um, now we need to let people know, um, I, I'm, I'm tie our messages around issues concerning the variants of concern and how, um, I mean, we, we need to get a certain percentage as, as the continent um, to reach, um, uh, at least for our adult population to be vaccinated at a certain percentage before we can sit back and relax and say that this is over. Um, so this is where we need to really look inward and take into uh, um, considerations our unique context as a continent. Um, um, we despite the fact that we are making progress, we're just not there yet. Um, some countries, a few countries have not even started their vaccines rollout yet. Um, I, um, I think it's only one country that has um, uh, has gotten up to 50% um, 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 of, uh, of the two doses already done. And uh, we are also seeing, um, I mean, um, uh, in, in, in a few countries that have even started the rollout, we're also seeing a surge in the cases that many countries are considering local lockdowns already. So I think for us, we need to start this messaging, uh, people mustn't get tired. Um, as a continent, we, we must push harder um, till we are able to um, um, totally um, control the pandemic in our context. We must keep wearing our masks, keep our hands um, um, washed with soap and water or use alcohol-based hand drops. And of course, um, as we go back to work, go back to schools uh, and, and, and meet people, we, we need to still maintain some um, um, physical distance um, 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 to reduce uh, 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 the spread of the infections. Um, so I think um, that's a, a wrap up from our side and we encourage you as you go about your daily um, routines to keep this messaging alive. Um, it is our role as IPC people um, to guide um, hospitals and healthcare workers, as well as the community. So I think now we, we, we really, really need to focus on our communities um, and in terms of our messaging, and, and we need to do it better. So um, this is a call to action for all of us, and hopefully we can um, 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 flatten um, the curve as we have done in the past. So thank you very much, and over to you, Anna. Thank you very much, Dr. Wande, and thank you very much to our two speakers, Erika and Dr. Tobin. It was really insightful. Thank you for all the questions. It's very good to hear about that. Thank you for all our panelists for joining us. I just want to remind you that tomorrow will be the French session, and then next week we will do week six, and then we have one week break uh, before we carry on. So please keep on um, attending, send us your questions or possible topics, and we will see what we can do. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.